Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today I want to touch on the topic of the Jewish wedding system and the bride of the Messiah. In the scriptures, the church is depicted both as the body of the Messiah and his bride. Regarding the latter, the thrust of all New Testament passages is that she is a betrothed bride who is not yet joined to her husband, the Messiah. So we're going to talk about first the arrangement. The first step in the Jewish wedding system was the arrangement, during which the father of the groom made the arrangements with the father of the bride for the marriage and paid the bride price. The timing of the arrangement varied. Sometimes it occurred when both the bride and the groom were still children. Other times it occurred at least one year before the marriage itself. Often the bride and groom did not even meet until their wedding day. The application of this step in the Jewish wedding system to the Bride of the Messiah is that God the Father, the Father of the Messiah the Groom, made the arrangement and then paid the bride price. The bride price was the blood of his son. This is seen in two passages of scripture. The first is Ephesians 5 verse 25, Messiah also loved the church and gave himself up for it. The second is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. By giving up his Son, and by shedding the blood of his Son, God the Father paid the bride price, and thus the arrangement was sealed with blood. Number two is the preparation. The second step in the Jewish wedding system was known as the preparation. This was the period of the betrothal. It lasted for at least a year, but it could also have lasted for many years, especially if the arrangement was made when the bride and groom were only children. During this time, the bride was prepared to take on the role of a wife. Furthermore, she was observed for her purity. The betrothal had to last a minimum of a year because this time span allowed at least a full nine months to pass to make sure that the bride was a virgin at the time of the betrothal. If she gave birth before the year was up, it demonstrated that she was in a state of immorality. The application of this stage to the church is that the bride is even now in the process of being perfected for the groom. Two passages deal with this fact. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul stated, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I espoused you to one husband that I might present you as a pure virgin to the Messiah. Paul explained that the church has been espoused or betrothed to one husband. The goal is that she might be presented as a pure virgin to the Messiah. She is now in the period of preparation, when the bride is being prepared to become a fitting wife for her husband. When the wedding day comes, she will be presented as a pure virgin to the Messiah. In Ephesians chapter 5, 26-27, Paul further detailed the process of sanctification which the church is currently undergoing. According to verse 26, this process involves the following points, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word. The term sanctify means to set apart or to be set apart. The church is being set apart for the Messiah to eventually be presented as a pure virgin to him. The means of sanctification is by the washing of water with the word. The phrase does not refer to water baptism, but to the water of the word of God. The church is being cleansed by the word of God as she becomes more and more conformed to what the scriptures teach. She becomes more and more that pure virgin to be presented to Messiah. Verse 27 provides the purpose of the process of sanctification, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The purpose is to present the bride as a glorious church. This is just another way of saying what was stated in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, namely, that the intent of sanctification is to present the church as a pure virgin to Messiah. The four characteristics of a glorified church are as follows. Number one, the church will have no spot, meaning there will be no outward defilement. 
Number two, there will be no wrinkle, meaning there will be no evidence of age. Number three, the church will be holy, meaning she will eventually reach full sanctification. And number four, there will be no blemish, meaning there will be no inward defilement. The church will be declared glorified at the judgment seat of the Messiah. At that time, the wood, hay, and stubble of each believer will be burned, while the gold, silver, and precious stones will be purified by the fire of that judgment. The final verse to consider in the context of the preparation of the bride of the Messiah is Ephesians 5.29. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Messiah also the church. Paul revealed the way the church is being made glorious. She is being nourished, built up, and given strength. The church is being cherished, meaning that she is receiving care with warmth and tenderness. Two thousand years have passed since God the Father paid the bride price. The period of betrothal or preparation will end with the next step in the Jewish wedding system, the fetching of the bride. The third step in the Jewish wedding system was known as the fetching of the bride. This event occurred a year or more after the marriage had been arranged and the bride price had been paid. It ended the period of preparation. The bridegroom would go to the home of his soon-to-be wife in order to pick her up and bring her to his home. It was the father of the groom who determined the timing of the fetching of the bride. Prior to the groom's leaving, he had to already have a place prepared for her as their abode. The application of this step to the bride of the Messiah will be accomplished by the rapture of the church. The main scripture is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. This passage describes the course of the rapture. In verses 13 through 15, Paul answers a question that was raised. Do believers who have died miss out on the benefits of the rapture? Apparently, while Paul had been with the Thessalonians, he had taught some truths concerning the rapture as it related to the living but not to the dead. But now some believers had passed away, and those they left behind were distressed by not knowing what the future had in store for them. So Paul comforted the bereaved family members with the truth that dead believers will not miss out on the benefits of the rapture. In fact, they will receive them first. In verses 16 through 17, Paul spelled out the sequence of the rapture in seven stages to show why this is true. First, the Messiah will come out of the heavens of heavens and descend into the atmospheric heavens. In doing so, he will enter into the realm of the home of his bride. Second, the Lord's descent will happen with a shout. The Greek word used is that of a command of a military leader who comes out of his tent and issues an order. One day, the chief commander will come out of his heavenly tent and give the order for the resurrection and the translation to occur. Third, the Lord's descent also will happen with the voice of the archangel. Angels are often used to put God's plan into motion. Michael the archangel will be used in the case of the rapture. The content of what the voice says is not stated. But if no military procedure can be applied, then this is simply a repetition of the order. The sub-commander repeats the order, the shout, of the chief commander. Yeshua will give the command for the course of the rapture to begin, and it is Michael's task to set it into motion so he will repeat the command. Fourth, the Lord's descent will also happen with the trump of God. The sound of the trumpet was used as a summons either to battle or to worship. With Michael's repetition of the command, the trumpet will sound and trigger the rapture itself. Thus, this trumpet will serve as a summons for the plan to go into motion. Fifth, the dead in Messiah shall rise first. This is the resurrection, and it is why dead believers will not miss out on the benefits of the rapture. To the contrary, they will begin to enjoy the benefits of the rapture first. The expression, in Messiah, limits the resurrection at the time of the rapture to those who were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body, which began in Acts chapter 2. The resurrection of dead saints will be limited to church saints only. The Old Testament saints will be resurrected 
at a latter point in God's prophetic program. Sixth, then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds. The resurrection of the dead saints will be followed by the translation of the living saints. Every believer, without exception, will be removed from the earth and will be united with the Lord in the heavens. The living believers will be caught up with the dead ones. The expression to be caught up is the source of the term rapture. The Greek word used is harpazo. When the verse was translated into Latin, the word rapo was used. The English word rapture comes from the Latin source. Seventh, the raptured saints will meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Both the resurrected dead believers and translated living believers will meet the Messiah in the air. Once they have been united with him in the air, they will permanently remain with him and return with him into heaven, as promised in John chapter 14. It is after the fetching of the bride into heaven that the final point of cleansing and sanctification will come. This final point has already been mentioned. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul described the judgment seat of the Messiah, when the wood, hay, and stubble will be burned away and the gold, silver, and precious stones will be purified. According to 1 Corinthians 15, the church will indeed be glorified because at that point, mortality will put on immortality and corruption will put on incorruption. Now let's look at the ceremony. The fourth step of the Jewish wedding system was the ceremony. It was conducted in the home of the groom. Only a few, usually the immediate family and two witnesses, were invited to come in and observe the wedding ceremony. The application of this fourth step to the church as the bride of the Messiah is that there will be a marriage ceremony in heaven. The main scripture that describes this step is Revelation 19, 6-8. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of many thunders, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be exceedingly glad, and let us give the glory unto him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And it was given unto her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. These verses make three main points. First, the marriage of the Lamb is come, verse 7. This describes the marriage ceremony of the Lamb, which will occur in heaven just before Yeshua's second coming. Second, the wife has made herself ready. She is now glorified. There is no spot, no wrinkle, no blemish, nor any such thing on her anymore. Third, she is arrayed in fine linen, bright and pure. The fine linen is interpreted as representing the righteous acts of the saints. This shows that by this time, the sanctification process is complete. The judgment seat of the Messiah is over, and the church is indeed a pure virgin. Now she is being presented to the Messiah at the wedding ceremony. The Marriage Feast the marriage feast is the fifth step in the Jewish wedding system. Often this feast lasted for seven days. While only a few people were invited to the wedding ceremony, many more were invited to celebrate the marriage of the Son. The application of this step to the church as the bride of the Messiah is that the marriage feast will take place on earth. In fact, it will initiate the messianic kingdom. Among the guests will be three groups that will not have participated in the wedding ceremony, but will be invited to the marriage feast. The first group will be composed of Old Testament saints who are resurrected after the tribulation, Daniel 12, verse 2, and Isaiah 26, verse 19. In John 3, John the Baptist considered himself to be neither part of the groom nor part of the bride, but rather part of the third category called the friend of the bridegroom. The friends of the bridegroom are the Old Testament saints. The second group is the tribulation saints who will be resurrected after the second coming. Revelation 20 verses 4 through 6. The third group will be the regenerated nation of Israel, meaning those Jews who survived the tribulation 
and come to faith in the Messiah. The invitation to the wedding feast will be sent out just before the Messiah's second coming. The Home of the Bride The sixth and final step of the Jewish wedding system concerns the home of the bride. Traditionally, the groom was responsible for providing a suitable home for the bride, and he got this home ready during the preparation stage. The application of the step to the church as the bride of the Messiah is seen in John chapter 14, where Yeshua said he was going to prepare a place for his bride. This place is known as the New Jerusalem. All believers will move into this home in the eternal order. The main scripture is Revelation 21 through 22, where John was able to see the home of the bride. In verses 9 and 10, he stated, And there came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, who were laden with the seven last plagues, and he spoke with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away into the Spirit, to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. According to verse 9, the bride is now the wife of the Lamb, because by this time the wedding ceremony and the wedding feast will have taken place, and the Lamb and his bride will have been married a thousand years. In verse 10, John saw the eternal home of the bride, the new Jerusalem. In conclusion, at this discussion of the relationship between the Jewish wedding system and the church as the bride of the Messiah has shown, some things have already been fulfilled, other things are in the process of being fulfilled, and again others will occur in the future. The conclusion is that there is a great future for those who have believed in the Messiahship of Yeshua. God bless and Maranatha.